Greetings and salutations. This is Abe Abdelhadi with The Bitter Truth, where we may not have all the answers, but we're going to ask an awful lot of questions. Uh, you can also become a bitter pill uh, by visiting patreon.com forward slash the bitter truth. And uh, I've been getting some messages and emails and things like that. Uh, people enjoying the show. If you want to also enjoy the show more, you can become a bitter pill and really support the show. Um, that being said, those of you that tuned in, I didn't know which title I'm going to use yet, whether it's Game of Drones or House of Cards. And if you tuned in on the Game of Drones title, thinking we're going to talk about the show, um, sorry to disappoint, but not really. Uh, we're going to be talking about <clears throat> what I like to refer to as the U.S., the United States of America's greatest hits when it comes to wars we got lied into. And, um, you know, it could be a longer history if I wanted to go all the way back, but I'm not going to. Um, but just to give a run-up on why I thought about this, um, Daniel Hale was arrested last week, and uh, he teamed up with The Intercept and Jeremy Scahill, um, excuse me, releasing uh, information uh, regarding U.S. war crimes. Uh, Chelsea Manning was recently released but has to testify in a couple of days. Um, and basically going to or went to jail for pleading the fifth and was exa- was uh, had her sentence commuted by Barack Obama uh, before he left office. So after doing seven years of a 35-year sentence, being dragged back in to testify against Julian Assange about uh, alleged, uh, you know, hacking or what have you. And uh, when those, Trump- those charges are trumped up, he simply published information that he was given and um, but long story short, it's not illegal to plead the fifth. The fifth is not designed um, to protect criminals. It's designed to protect the government from becoming thieves. And so with Julian Assange, there is no difference than him or any other publisher, whether it's The Intercept or Julian Assange and Daniel Hale and Jeremy Scahill. Um, what we've had a tendency to do for a while now is to make the illegal legal uh, between Patriot Acts 1 and 2 and the American Defense of um, the Author- uh, Authorization Act, uh, ADAA, more commonly known, we have literally gutted so many constitutional provisos that it's become legal to do things that basically Nixon was busted for. Um, and why is this important? It's a slippery slope that we've been on for a while. And especially in the case of Julian Assange, acting no different than the New York Times or the Washington Post, which if anybody saw that movie, The Post, <clears throat> you know, made the Washington Post look like a bunch of heroes because at the time they were really looking to get into some trouble for publishing between the New York Times and Washington Post, um, you know, Watergate and the Pentagon Papers and everything else. But um, which is interesting because the government has been hassling press the press for a long, long time. It was just finally when it got down to the Washington Post being hassled that, you know, the the press, the media rallied against uh, against Nixon. That's just my Humble observation. Um, but let's jump into it. So the uh, Spanish-American War, 1898, um, was basically, I think, you know, the first huge propaganda war. It lasted about four months. And, you know, in the formation of the country, we were colonizing uh, the entire country, the American Indian. And then, you know, we, we got into wars with, with, with Mexico and got that land. <clears throat> and... Um, Long story short, we ran out of real estate. We get to we get to the West Coast and like, well, where do we go? And you got to understand, we've been only out of the Civil War about thirty years. So imagine if in the nineties we were going to plunge back into Iraq, um, having still feeling the sting of Vietnam. Most people, because twenty years ago, a lot of people were still feeling the sting of Vietnam. Um, same thing. No one really had a stomach for war. Half a million guys got killed in the Civil War. No one was really excited about jumping into the Spanish-American, so you need a reason. And uh, the USS Maine was blown up in the uh, in the Havana Harbor, and uh, we blamed Cuba. And we just immediately said it was uh, it was Cuba, and justified going into the you know into the war. And we you know, went into the Philippines and everything else. <clears throat> and it, was, it lasted four months. And Theodore Roosevelt actually made a name for himself. He shot the fame with the Rough Riders because they basically, you know, kicked a lot of ass. And a lot of his guys got killed. But still, he came out a hero, became vice president under McKinley. McKinley gets shot in 1901. And Theodore Roosevelt becomes president. But uh, it's interesting that the Department of the Navy in 1976 releases a report that the actual incident with the Maine in Havana Harbor, excuse me, 
was um, an electrical fire. But it was listed as, oh my God, they blew up the main, right? So all that to say that um, that was the first big lie. And William Randolph Hearst, who had a monopoly on newspapers in the country, I think at the time he owned 65% of the country's papers, um, you give me the prose and I'll give you the war. And if you make the print big enough, people will believe it. Tell the lie often enough, people will believe it. And he created a war. And so basically we bought it and went right into headlong into uh, the Spanish-American. And again, it was only four months. Um, I'm not sure how many people were killed. I think we lost about 20,000 troops in that, uh, in that war. But still, it was for what? For a whole lot of nothing. Just to actually colonize and continue on what ended up becoming um, empire building versus imperialism. We don't say imperialism in the United States. We like to say that we're occupying. Now, we don't even say occupying. We have bases all over because we're protecting people. So we make up a lot of bullshit. <clears throat> Next is uh, World War I. I'm going to spend some time here because this really gives us the framework for the rest of the wars of the rest of the century. So World War I, for example, you know, 28th President Woodrow Wilson, he was the uh, governor of New Jersey, president of Princeton before that. And, um, you know, 1914, the war breaks out, but the U.S. was neutral, supplying stuff to the U.K. And so, basically, um, Britain is dying to drag us into the war because they need help. <clears throat> and this is not unfamiliar, if you remember World War II. So, uh, 1915, the Lusitania, which was a British ship, not an American ship, was sunk by um, a German U-boat. Now, it had about 1,200 passengers, but, and 139 Americans were killed. So, you know, that's an international incident, not necessarily anything to go to war over. And uh, Wilson condemned the action, excuse me, but the Hawks in his administration said it was an attack and, you know, after two years of pressure, 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 we got dragged into the war. Now, we needed a major disaster to get the U.S. into the war, according to Winston Churchill, who at the time was the first Lord of the Admiralty. And he was part of the Royal Navy escort uh, of the Lusitania. And they were well aware of German U-boats in the area. They were warned by the Germans. If you travel into certain lanes, you're going to lose ships. Um, so it was really his inaction that created the incident that he was looking for to, you know, uh, and he wasn't the only one, <clears throat> but he was definitely responsible by his inaction of the Lusitania. And so finally we get dragged into the war um, two years later and we ended up losing over half a million guys in that one too. Now, um, if you've ever read the book, you know, War is a Racket by Smedley D. Butler, which I highly recommend. And A, it's not long, it's about 58 pages. And B, it's not expensive, it's about $2 um, on Amazon or eBay or anything else. Uh, it's almost basically a thick brochure. And he talks about how he was basically as a ma lieutenant ma a major general of the United States Marine Corps at the time, the highest ranked uh, Marine at, and, and the most decorated Marine at that time, that he was basically nothing but a paid thug for corporations. For corporations. And when you look at um, what happened out of World War I, for example, Walter Lipp Lippmann formalized uh, German journalism as propaganda, basically. It was a downhill slide from there. He was off, and, and no, no coincidence, I mean, or it was a coincidence, I suppose. Uh, he was uh, F Sigmund Freud's nephew. So he may, I don't know, maybe over dinner, over the holidays, and they, <laughs> they talked a little psychology, I have no idea. But um, we went right to work demonizing the Germans. So no German composers were performed in the United States. No Bach, no Beethoven, no Handel, nothing. Sauerkraut becomes Liberty Cabbage. Doesn't that sound familiar? Remember when the French wouldn't back us in the Iraq war with the phony WMDs, which I'll cover in a second. But um, we, we, we didn't call them French fries for a while. We called them Freedom Fries. Remember that? Same thing. Sauerkraut becomes Liberty Cabbage. We had false testimony in hearings regarding rape squads. Um, <clears throat> the German rape squads and they were and, and, and witnesses were coming forward saying I've never seen such savagery um, against women and blah 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 and it was all it was all bullshit um, the Department of Department of War because we have it wasn't called the Department of Defense until 1949 but the Department of War suddenly at that point gets into the movie business um, and has been in the movie business for the past hundred and couple hundred and five years basically um, you know, with, with, with few exceptions, the Department of Defense does not like movies like Apocalypse Now or Platoon or The Deer Hunter or 
Slaughterhouse-Five or anything that is going to be negative toward war. They support Top Gun and shit like that. And they really do have a, a tendency to be in uh, television and film. If it's CIA tested and mother, mother, mother approved, I promise you, it has the, de- the Department of Defense's uh, fingerprints all over it. But, um, you know, back to 1915, 16, um, they get into the movie business. D.W. Griffith's um, birth, of a na- you know, birth of a Nation guy, uh, he gets cash for Hearts of the World. And it began, you know, a long tradition of, of government funding and, and censorship. They, they go through scripts and they approve things. Uh, Zero Dark Thirty is a good example <clears throat> where the entire first half hour is bullshit. They didn't get any of that intel um, from torturing people. That has proven to be a failure. And um, so, they, they, you know, that entire movie was 100% bullshit. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's, it's interesting. So what ends up happening um, – you see the the, 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 the pattern. I kind of went quickly through World War One, but you hit all the bullet points. And it gets into every other thing that we've done. Um, and World War One, interestingly enough, um, we, you know, had the Germans as enemies. And we got tired of the Germans. And then we were not cool with the Russians because they had just become communist. And we don't like that. That's bad. Communism is bad. The way the Russians did it was, was bad. But... Um, we should be minding our own fucking business is sort of the point of all of this today. <laughs> um, and then World War II, again, got a problem with the Germans. We get tired of Germans, and we move on to the Russians. And, uh, well, we ran out of Germans, so we, you know, demonized the Arabs, which isn't hard to do. A billion and five Muslims in, this, in, the, in the world, rather. 20% of them are Arabs, um, but, see, but everyone seems to have a problem with Muslims, really have a problem with Arabs. Um, ignoring the fact that about a quarter of them are Christian uh, who believe the same crap you do about Jesus. So um, the rest of this is going to go pretty quickly, but we get the idea. Uh, It's basically lie, propaganda, repeat. And, um, you know, World War II, I'm going to leave World War II out of this for this segment because I could probably do an hour on World War II. Um, You know, there's there's a lot of of not-so-obvious things and a lot of obvious things. So I'm not going to, you know, take a deep dive into World War II, really, today. I might do that at, a, at, a, at another time when <clears throat> I got a bunch of crap on my chest, and I'll just probably tie that in. But, um, you know, the, the simple part first, you know, you know people, the, the big theory is we knew Pearl Harbor was going to happen. We let it happen anyway um, because our FDR did want us to get into the war to, def, to, to help Britain, to help France. And the U.S. had no stomach for it because World War I was just 20 years ago. And we lost a half a million people in World War I. Um, but let's jump into the Korea War. North Korea, aided by the Chinese, moves into South Korea. Uh, and the excuse we made here was we're, you know, we're fighting commies. And I don't know how much the government was terribly afraid of communism as much as they used it to scare people. The godless commies who are going to come fuck your women. That was sort of the big pitch. Kind of the pitch with all of our enemies because we do things out of fear. And as Henry Wallace said... Um, the biggest mistakes we make are those decisions that we make out of fear. Um, so, you know, but nobody really reports that. And they don't report, you know, that, you know, China, who just recently went communist in 1949, was active. And they didn't really report. They, they made it sound like we were fighting the North Koreans when we actually had air fights with the Chinese. And Eisenhower, one of the great things he did in his administration was get, get us the fuck out of Korea because he knew that we we're going to get into World War III with China. And the chances were really good with the tensions that Truman had created with Russia, um, you know, with the, with the bombing of, of Japan and every, with the A-bomb and everything else. It's, again, it's a big, World War II is a big subject. But um, Eisenhower knew that we, if we got in a, in a fight with China, we would probably end up getting in a fight with Russia. I and mean, he didn't want that. So we just called it a draw. And at the 38th parallel, North Korea became North Korea and South Korea became South Korea. But not before we lost 60,000 American soldiers and killed 2 million Koreans and wiped it out. The, the rebuild of Korea is South, North and South Korea is actually kind of a, a small miracle. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, uh, you know, basically the, the atomic bomb was, you know, Truman flexing his muscle. Um, the, you know, the, the challenge with, with all of that is you know, we just don't seem to learn. And I'm thinking as I move on through this list, what kind of just hit me was there's actually five, 10 years, 20 years in between a lot of these wars of the last century, 
But then when you think about what we've been doing the last 20 years, we don't remember what we did last week. I'm going to get to that in a second. But let's talk about Vietnam for a hot minute. Um, it's a fact that JFK, who's no saint, by the way, you know, he, I think he's been lionized because he got assassinated. But he did sign an executive order <clears throat> to have a thousand troops home by the end of 1963 and everyone home by the end of 1965. And that was going to be the cornerstone of his campaign. Because it was already getting out that guys were getting killed. In fact, in 1963, 663 men lost their lives in Vietnam. And it was supposed to be just uh, an, an advi- in an advisory capacity. They weren't supposed to be uh, fighting. Uh, so basically, it was, it was starting to look bad. And America really didn't want to deal in a foreign Asian war. Um, but then he got killed in November of 1963. And that was the end of it. And Johnson escalates that war. The very next year. And so he used the Gulf of Tonkin as an excuse. Now, the Gulf of Tonkin, if you don't recall, was supposedly um, in the Gulf of Tonkin. One of our warships was attacked and, you know, by, by, the Vietnamese, by the North Vietnamese. That didn't happen. It, didn't, it wasn't even a parking ticket that was exaggerated. It, didn't absol- it, it absolutely did not happen. It was an absolute fraud. But it was pitched in the American press as an attack and was used as an excuse to justify escalation into Vietnam. Uh, we sent over, I think it was close to 2 million troops. We lost 57,000 men and women in that war. We killed 4 million Vietnamese. Uh, again, 4 million Vietnamese, 2 million Koreans. Wow, that sounds like a Holocaust to me. Um, but they're brown people, yellow people. Who cares, right? That's kind of the, seems to be the attitude. We give a shit when they're, when they're white people. I'll get to that in a second. Um, you know, and then so we're embarrassed. I remember as a kid, um, <clears throat> you know, people... Adults, because it, it, war ended when I was like 12. Um, but people being pitched this idea that, you know, we, we were humiliated. We lost. First of all, it was an illegal action. We didn't belong there. And whoever and however they want to govern their country is none of our business. So, you know, tail between our legs, you know, Ronald Reagan comes in, into play. Excuse me. And he's supposed to be this bright, shiny, positive, sunny guy. And, um, you know, he's trying to get American pride back. That's the pitch anyway. So in 1983, we invade, <laughs> we invade the country of Grenada. Um, now understand in October of 1983, 300 Marines were killed by a truck bomb in Lebanon. And, you know, I think Reagan being rendered impotent in that, in that situation, uh, three days later, decided to invade Grenada, a population of 60,000 people at the time. I think now it's up to 107,000 people, uh, claiming that it was a hotbed of communist activity. Um, A town the size of Round Rock, Texas, a country the size of Round Rock, Texas, uh, was invaded by the United States Army. Um, You know, and we we won. I think we got the guy, the, 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 the president, and arrested him and all this other bullshit that we just do. Because we've been at war, uh, with the exception of 16 years, we've been at war every year since 1776. We've just not been at war for 16 years. So in 243 years, we've only had 16 years of actual peace. And that should terrify the fuck out of anybody that's listening to this today. Um, so uh, then we get to, uh, you know, we get to Iraq. The first one, the first Iraq, 1990, uh, under George H.W. Bush. Now, I want to spend a little time here because people think that that was justified because, you know, Iraq illegally invaded Kuwait. Um, Well, most invasions are illegal. Last I checked, it's not cool to go fuck with a nation's sovereignty, you know, because you feel like it. Mm. Well, what had happened was is Saddam Hussein had fought Iran for us for nearly a decade. And he had discovered that while he was distracted with fighting Iran, Kuwait was cross-drilling into his oil supply because they were neighbors. And he had warned them repeatedly for nearly a year to quit doing it or he was going to do something about it. And they said, well, hey, fuck you, Saddam. We have friends in the United States. And he's like, fuck you back, so do I. So he calls the Iraqi ambassador or the United States ambassador to Iraq, rather, a woman named April Glaspie into his office and asks her specifically these words, what is the U.S. opinion on Arab-Arab conflict? And she said, 
without checking with the Department of State, without calling the White House, without talking to the Pentagon, that the United States does not have an opinion on Arab-Arab conflict. Just don't invade Israel and don't mess with Israel. And so he said, okie dokie. So he invaded Kuwait. Um, And the idea was to basically control the oil wells to have them stop stealing his shit. Now, this is where life is, you know, not always black and white. He's a dictator. I get it. He was killing some people. I get it. Um, He's a dictator. It's kind of what they do. Never went west of Jordan, I don't believe, although he had a lot of money, Uh, which makes sense because President George W. Bush, I don't think ever left the United States until he became president. So, um, you know, one idiot begets another. Um, But again, the U.S. had no permission or no permission, no stomach for war. You know, Vietnam wasn't even 15 years out of the gate. We were, you know, little victories like Grenada. I don't think anyone was fooled by that shit. And, you know, we, you know, Panama was 100% illegal by invading Panama and arresting a sitting president and trying him in Miami. If that's not American exceptionalism, I don't know what is, but I digress. So this girl named Narina, Narina, I can never say her name right now, Narina, whatever her name is. Um, she was actually the, the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador. And I, I jump ahead a little bit. She's the girl who tearfully testified um, that she witnessed with her own eyes, even though she had not lived in Kuwait for about 10 years. She witnessed with her own eyes babies thrown out of incubators and left to die on the floor like, like, like cold mice. And she was crying and, and it was horrible. And she turned out to be the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador who was coached by the PR firm of Hill and Knowlton. And um, that came out a couple of months after the war was over. So it was kind of awkward. But for three months, all we heard was the president going around there throwing babies out of incubators. They're killing them. Saddam is a Hitler. He's a Hitler of the desert. He's got to be stopped. So that, again, more bullshit. So we went in there, carpet bombed a country for about a month and a half. And I remember distinctly, because I was in my mid-20s, almost late, late, no, yeah, late 20s at the time, um, hearing all this fear-mongering by the American media that, you know, oh my God, you know, if, if we go in there, all the run up to the war, you know, they have the elite Republican guard and to steal a joke from Bill Hicks, the elite Republican guard went down to the Republican guard, went down to the Republicans made up this shit about guards in the first place, because without a peep of response and after six weeks of continual carpet bombing, we killed somewhere in the neighborhood of, I think about uh, 150,000 Iraqis in that period of time. Um, we knew where his palaces were. We didn't destroy a whole lot of stuff that was his, but we destroyed infrastructure. We destroyed food supplies. We did a lot of war crime stuff that we are not supposed to do. And then um, the uh, the punchline of all of that is we imposed sanctions. And uh, that's a nice word of saying we're going to kill more people because we killed a half a million Iraqi babies between 1992 and the year 2000 when he got off the dollar and said, fuck you, I'm getting off the dollar now. And started uh, dealing with the euro. And that's another, uh, another topic for uh, in the next few minutes. I'll cover, I'll cover what that means when I get to Libya here. But um, all of that to say, uh, continual bullshit. Now, there, here's an exception. Here's another little exception. So the serb Croat wars, you know, Bosnia, uh, you know, UN troops did a lot. We backed them up. Uh, if you ever heard uh, Chris Ward come on the show, he actually served... Um, in Kosovo, he's, you know, he, he was there, he saw a lot of stuff. Um, but it's just, it's just kind of interesting how when white people are being, um, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Um, executed or what, you know, genocided again. I know I'm, I'm, I'm a little tired. Um, exterminated (laughs) when white people are being exterminated. Um, we seem to care. And when Muslims were being exterminated, we only cared because they were white Europeans, and that sounds cruel and crass and everything else, but it's kind of the truth if you look at our track record. Because right now we're currently bombing eight countries, and Obama, Barack Obama, Obama, um, for example, in 2016 dropped two, 26,000 bombs in Syria alone. And Trump has more than doubled that number. He's more than doubled that number on every country that Obama left him with. And now he wants to get into Venezuela and Iran, which I'll get into in a second. So with, 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 I do get into some exception, like I said, but then, you know, our reasoning for it, excuse me, in my opinion, isn't completely pure, right? So let me get into Iraq too and Afghanistan. And so far, this is the longest 
time that this country has been at war. We've been at war <clears throat> going on 18 years. Afghanistan, uh, we invaded in the fall of uh, 2001, if you recall. Uh, went into Iraq in March of 2003. Um, both countries had nothing to do with 9-11. Um, Afghanistan was accused of harboring Osama bin Laden. But the 9-11 Commission report showed that the Saudis and Pakistan had everything to do with 9-11. But we didn't stay there. We didn't stay on that course, did we? We, we kept, you know, insisting that it was Iraq. Um, and one of the reasons is, you know, 2003, when we made up the whole WMD thing, despite UN, expect, UN inspectors and people like Scott Ritter, by the way, if you've not read any of his books or seen him interviewed, I highly recommend you Googling or YouTubing Scott Ritter. The guy's a genius. And uh, he's not exactly, you know, uh, a warm and fuzzy bunny. He's not exactly a, um, uh, a dove but he's a person who believes to do the right thing and why he was there was to find out the real information to determine if we should be invading a sovereign nation and knocking out their leader, <clears throat> which he and other UN weapons inspectors said we do not. He, they did not have any WMDs. And we declared that – he declared that period. See, but here's the thing. Um, in 2000, I mentioned earlier that Saddam Hussein got off the dollar, told us to go fuck ourselves and got on the euro. Well, in 2000 when Dick Cheney was running as VP with George W. Bush – um, decrying uh, Iraq getting off the dollar in a paper by the Project for a New American Century, th and this is a quote now, short of a Pearl Harbor type of an incident, invading Iraq would be a tough sell. And the big fear was in that interim before Iraq gets pressured enough and pressed enough to get back on the dollar, in those ensuing years, other countries, other Arab countries, would get off the dollar. Because they think, okay, there's no, there's, no, uh, there's, no, there's no consequence. We can get off the dollar and we can give the bird, flip the bird to the U.S., right? Now, uh, in the meantime, um, in, by invading Iraq and knocking that guy out, uh, nothing happened what we were promised. Donald Rumsfeld promised it'd be a couple of months. We budgeted $50 billion and two months to, hand, to have the whole thing handled and democracy delivered on a platter to the Iraqi people. Uh, so far, I think the numbers are between a half a million and 750,000 civilians we've killed in Iraq. We've killed 8,000 of our own kids. Um, the Iraq issue alone is costing this country over $5 trillion over the last uh, 16 years now. So not exactly well planned. And this is what happens when people who haven't been shot at plan wars. Um, it's kind of like somebody who's not athletic at all and never rode a skateboard gets on one of those fucking scooters but you know that's another topic um libya 2011 same deal we went ahead and um had a problem with Gaddafi all of a sudden interesting how in 2003 he gave up his nukes so that he could be let back into the world community instead of just selling his oil to <clears throat> russia and india basically um so he gave up his nukes he promised to be a good boy um, and you don't think Kim Jong-il is looking at this shit? Yes, he is. He is not giving up anything. He's not stupid. He might be chubby and he might need his position to get laid, but he's not stupid. Um, so long story short, um, after giving up his nukes in 2003, 2009, he gets made um, chairman of the African Council. Not to be confused with the ANC, um, but he gets made chairman of the African Council. The entire continent of Africa has a council, and everybody gets a shot at being the chairman for about four years. They get elected. In 2009, he gets the big whiz-bang idea, and there's two pages of this in their charter for the year he was um, you know, put into the position <clears throat> that they were going to get off the dollar, and he was going to get Africa off the dollar and take the dinar and make it their own and back it with – African resources, gold, silver, minerals, oil, and um, call it the Afro. Clever, huh? Well, we didn't like that. So we needed a reason. So after a NATO-led uh, invasion uh, by Nicolas Sarkozy, who in 2007 uh, received $50 million in a campaign contribution from more and more Gaddafi. Uh, he's on trial this summer for that, by the way. Um, we, they, they, we followed suit and we wiped out Libya and he was executed in the street. Now, again, dictator, I get it. Uh, responsible for Lockerbie, I get it. 
But how many things are we responsible for? Every one of our presidents for at least the last hundred years, uh, well, well, with a few exceptions, were just fucking war criminals. And they did more than blow up a jetliner. Okay. Barack Obama alone, George W. Bush alone should be in jail. Uh, Elliot Abrams, John Bolton, those guys should be in jail. Elliot Abrams is responsible for 80,000 El Salvadorans being murdered in the 80s with the same playbook he's trying to go in El Salvador with. Um, I'm going to go into that bit in a, in a bit. But just to simply to say, we created a failed state because Gaddafi, um, doing some of the dictator things he does, like he, you know, he wasn't cool with the press and what have you. But you know what they had? They had right, women, women had rights in Libya. They had free college and they had health care. Mm, isn't that funny? Um, it's amazing what, uh, what a dictator can do with a few bucks. Uh, oh, by the way, Vladimir Putin, Russia, $65 billion a year on defense because what they got, free health care. You're welcome. Syria, excuse me, kind of came out of the Arab Spring. Arab Spring, my ass. This is what I think it was. And people that say that I'm being a conspiracy theorist or, you know, I'm being paranoid. First of all, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Uh, secondly, um, I would like for anyone to tell me of a democracy that actually came out of the Arab Spring. It was pitched in the United States media and in, in the mainstream European press as this beautiful revolution of people standing up for their rights. Uh, two weeks ago, the Saudis just chopped off 37 heads for just because they were free speaking about some stuff. So I don't know where the democracy is in Saudi Arabia. Um, Jordan, King Abdullah still there, doing the same King Abdullah shit that we kind of ignore because he's our boy. Um, Egypt, no, same, uh, same, you meet the old boss, same as the new boss. We arrested the guy that was democratically elected because we didn't like him or his party because he's part of the Muslim Brotherhood. Again, kind of none of our business. And he did like the idea of getting $3 billion a year to not attack Israel, which is what we've been doing for nearly 40 years now, is paying Egypt and Jordan to play ball with Israel. So that wasn't going to change. So what was it all about? I don't know. Maybe it was about saber rattling and shaking the cages of some of these motherfuckers because they were getting a little bit too big for their britches. And so Gaddafi fell into that whole Libya thing, part of the Arab Spring. When we sent in what they called moderate rebels, kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? So we're, we, we still have, mo we, we just beat some moderate rebels in Syria, supposedly. <clears throat> With Gaddafi in Libya, Long story short, we paid Al-Qaeda and Al-Nusra and ISIS, the same guys that we had fucking about in Syria. We paid them. We paid them, terrorist groups that we are terrified of in the United States, didn't call them by name, called them moderate rebels. And they were the guys that we assisted with NATO-led carpet bombing of Libya. The interim government in Libya is a failure. It's a failed state like Iraq. And the failed government of Libya now has slaves. And where are they getting those slaves from? Yemen. And why are they getting slaves from Yemen? They're escaping their country. And why are they escaping their country? Because the Saudis are bombing the fuck out of them and have been for a lot of years now. In fact, it's projected that at the end of this year, 250,000 Yemenis will die of starvation. And we've already killed something in the neighborhood of about 90,000 with bombing, allowing the Saudis to bomb their food supplies, medicine factories, all the war crime shit you're not supposed to do but we let them do it. So when I say Arab spring my ass, it's exactly right. And I could be, or I'm exactly right. I think I'm exactly right. But uh, think about this for a minute. And again, uh, point to me a single democracy that came out of the Arab spring because you can't. And because you can't, because there isn't one. Nothing happened. It was a big fireworks show to allow us to do some really sneaky CIA shit. And what's funny about that is every time that crap comes up, people say you're being paranoid. And now it's a faster turnaround time. Back in the day when I was a kid, it took like, I don't know, five to 10 years for this stuff to be exposed. Now it's like six months. Anyway, um, Syria, right? Let's talk about Syria for a hot second. We used the Arab Spring to, to, to go after Syria. Of course, they had people protesting in the streets, Assad, <clears throat> kind of brutal. You know, um, but no brutal than the other 73% of the world's dictators that we support. Who we support as long as they do what we want. Again, Arab spring my ass. Let's look at what happened with Assad. Qatar and Saudi Arabia wanted to run a natural gas pipeline through Syria into Turkey, into Europe. Syria said no. Why? Because Russia's his main ally. Russia's always got his back. 
kind of like we always have Israel's back, which is why we're going to have World War III down there. Um, but he didn't want to fuck with that because he didn't want to get into their oil and gas business because they sell oil and gas to Europe. So he didn't want to run a pipeline through his country, something his ally would not like. Um, so the Arab Spring conveniently came up and all the countries kind of did their thing and kind of dust has settled, except for Egypt, which is going through a ton of fuckery right now. Um, and what happened? We're still bombing the shit out of them and trying to get a regime change and trying to get Assad to leave and resign and blah, 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 blah. Why? Why? So everybody in question can make money. And Turkey is our NATO ally. Isn't that nice? So um, again, you know, and then coming soon. <laughs> oh, and by the way, um, you know, we're going after Iran and Venezuela. Um, and if you think we're not going to, you know, try to invade Iran, um, and I'm jumping ahead, uh, you're out of your mind. But let's just stick with Venezuela for a hot minute. Uh, the things you hear on the mainstream press, in the mainstream press, are lies. Um and if you look at any other reputable uh, press coverage, and I'm talking about The Intercept and The Guardian and Mint Press News and Truth Dig and The Gray Zone and, you know, uh, actual reporters, not people that just get a fax from the CIA and read it uncritically on the news um, or make up a bunch of Russia Gate type gossip shit like Rachel Madcow, um, you would see that Venezuela uh, did not install a dictator. He won that election. The people that didn't, quote, participate in that election last year, uh, one party chose not to participate. Several of his opponents tried to kill him. Uh, that's why they weren't participating, because they were in jail. See, now, I don't care what you think about the president, but if someone tries to kill him, I think we could all agree that it's a bad idea for them to run in the next <laughs> election. You can't have, you know, Bernie Sanders trying to assassinate the president and then he's going to get to run for president. It doesn't work that way. You know, you go to jail when you try to kill a president. Most countries are funny about that. I don't, I, maybe, maybe I'm too liberal. Maybe I'm too soft. Maybe I'm too progressive. Maybe I'm a crazy person. Maybe I don't think the people that try to kill the president should run for president. I, I don't know. I don't know. That's just me. Maybe that's just me. But, um, but yeah, uh, the metric that people use Human rights violations, blah, 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 blah. Well, no one gave a shit about human rights violations or starving people in the 80s when Venezuela claimed to be capitalist and 50% of the people were starving, okay? Nobody gave a shit. And all of a sudden, Hugo Chavez wins in 1998. Suddenly we give a shit. Then we discovered that they have the largest oil reserves in the world. Those people are going to need some democracy, as Jimmy Dore likes to say. Um, they have a 4% poverty rate between Hugo Chavez and, and Nicolas Maduro. Is, are they, were they perfect? Is he perfect? No, not by a long shot. But it's their fucking government. It's none of our business. So let's, let, let's get back. So 4% poverty rate in Venezuela, even with the sanctions, Barack Obama left office with 60 sanctions. Trump imposed 45 more. Um, so now there's 105 sanctions on the country of Venezuela. In the last 20 months, we have stolen one point or six, $6 billion of their money. We took $1.2 billion in gold. Bank of England sees that. We close their Chase accounts in the United States. Citgo, if you drive around, you see those little Citgo gas stations. That's a Venezuelan company. That's owned by the government of Venezuela. We have frozen their transfers. They cannot transfer funds to the owners of that company, which is the government of Venezuela. We stop their medicine shipments. We stop their food shipments. They got to take it from us. U.S. aid, which is the same shit Elliot Bolton did in El Salvador, which basically is an excuse to put weapons to get it into the hands of, you know, Juan Guaido. So his guys can actually maybe, you know, have a successful coup. Fucking loser already, you know, screwed up again. He can't even run a successful coup. He's an absolute douchebag who was told by the vice president of the United States, Mike Pence, that it's okay for him to declare himself president. The fuck are we doing? This hegemony shit has to stop. Hegemony. H E G. E, M-O-N-Y. You know what that means? That means I'm going to punch you in the face, shocked as hell that you don't pay me for it, and even more surprised that you punch me back. That's hegemony. When we think we could do whatever the fuck we want with this manifest destiny and the Monroe Doctrine and, and, and say that South America is in our backyard so we could do whatever the fuck we want, no. It's time for us to stop being these kinds of bullies. I digress. Colombia, next door, capitalist country, Colombia. Did you know that? It's Columbia, it's, it's capitalist country. They're also a NATO nation now. And if you had geography, Colombia's not in Europe. <laughs> the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, nothing to do with South America. But hey, and Brazil is applying because, you know, Jair Bolsonaro, prick that he is, um, is um, 
you know, he's he's uh, he, he's he's applying to be a NATO nation too because Brazil, you know, needs to protect needs to protect um, France, you know, because when France goes to war with the Russians, you know, Brazil's gonna be right there. Um, anyway, I digress. So thir- so Colombia, who's capitalist Colombia, enjoys a thirty percent poverty rate. They actually do murder gen- and jail journalists. They murder campesinos by the thousands, and those are basically farmers who don't grow crops for the right people, i.e., the CIA. Excuse me. And they actually participate in actual rigging of elections, voting fraud. Whereas last year's elections were declared by many commissions and even former President Jimmy Carter, who was there to observe as one of the cleanest elections they've ever seen in the last 20 years. But Colombia? Why don't we invade Colombia? They got human rights violations up the ass. Oh, but they say they're capitalist. Oh, that's why. Okay. 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 That's what we do. We're hypocrites. We're lying sacks of shit. We are absolute hypocrites and we will invade and take your shit. And in, in Colombia's case, subjugate your people to work for 15 cents a day and no bathroom breaks. Iran just heard that they were involved in some fuckery in the Strait of Hormuz, uh, which is absolute bullshit. Um, I believe it's John Bolton and Elliot Abrams doing the same kind of shit we did with the uh, uh, USS Maine, but there wasn't an accident to take advantage of. We're actually doing it and make it look like the Iranians did it. So we could justify going into Iran. And, and what's, what's the whole thing with Iran? You know, how many bases do they have outside of Iran? Zero. Oh, but they're the number one purveyor of terror. Are they really? That's kind of interesting. We support 73% of the world's dictators. We occupy 80% of the world. We bomb the fuck right now out of eight countries. Every single day, we drop about 144 bombs a day. And I'm wondering what the definition of terror is then. Um, well, they got nuclear weapons. Well, no. They don't. Uh, they passed inspection too a few years back when we made the Iran deal. And not only did they pass inspection, but they've been playing ball for the last four years. But Donald Trump didn't make the Iran deal. So he doesn't like any deal he didn't make because he's trying to make the exact same deal with North Korea. And he failed because he's a tool. But the big excuse is, oh, now they're going to develop nukes. Israel has 500 nuclear weapons. And they've never sub- uh, submitted to an IAEA investigation ever. And we don't ask any questions about Israel. And you want to tell me that Benjamin Netanyahu is sane? He's stable? Look what they're doing in Gaza. It's apartheid, genocide, everything. It's a full-on theocracy. The same as Iran. But we keep calling Iran a theocracy and Israel is not. Better yet, we keep calling Iran a theocracy and the Saudis are not. They're Wahhabi, for Christ's sake. Those guys, you know, it's it's one of the, the strictest forms of Islam. And they show it all the time by executing people for traffic tickets, human rights violations up the ass. We don't seem to mind. Um, but, you know, bottom line, you know, I mean, you know what? As a side note, I think we're going to invade Mexico in a year. I, I swear to God, ever since they got that socialist guy in there, I'm like, they're going to invade their ass. I, that's why. I mean, we'll, we'll, oh, they would never invade Mexico. Yeah, yeah, we would. Yeah, we would. I remember Sarajevo was the site of the Winter Olympics in, um, I think it was 1980. No, no, 1982. Gorgeous, gorgeous facilities. It was amazing. And then, you know, they were in a war. And we were bombing the fuck out of them. So, um, yeah. Um, I, I think we could do the same in Mexico. Just because Sammy Hagar has Cabo Wabo there doesn't mean shit. I think we can justify anything. And that's kind of what we do. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to wrap up, I suppose. Uh, guys, um, again, you can become a, uh, uh, a bitter pill by visiting patreon.com forward slash the bitter pill. And, um, you know, again, appreciate the support. Uh, appreciate the, the, the cards and letters, at least electronically. And uh, if this stuff makes you uncomfortable, it's supposed to, so sleep tight. <laughs>